welcome Paul Kaufman. Thank you. I have to point out there's a number of agitators in the audience here. I've got to be careful of <laughs> <laughs> Including someone in the back row I hadn't seen sneak in. <laughs> Tiffin Glass. Okay, better yet. Tiffin made glass. Everybody thinks that the glass that I'm associated with was Tiffin glass. The reality is, no. Let's go back and do a little bit of history. 1888, the Board of Trade of Tiffin, as they were called at that time, published newspaper articles around the state asking for industry to move to Tiffin because of the finding of natural gas. And they were making available property to build industrial sites on. That response brought in eight factories within an eight-month period. Already in Tiffin, as far as industry goes, was national machinery. And I'm told Webster Manufacturing was here starting up at that time also. But locally, there were two glass factories starting up here in Tiffin before that ad got started. One of them being the Tiffin Glass Company. Samuel Sneath, a name who will come to your mind as a part of Tiffin's history, put together a conglomerate of people to build a glass factory out on 2nd Avenue. This is where things get tough, being able to read my own writing. At that time, 2nd Avenue uh, was called Broad Street at its intersection. We call it Wall Street now. Second and Wall is where Samuel Sneath built the first Tiffin Glass Company. A wooden structure designed to make novelty items, I call them. And if you go into the museum here, you'll see some of those novelty items. Little donkey carts, dog pulling carts, goat pulling carts, some of them with a monkey sitting on top of the cart that were used for toothpicks and matches. That was the industrial output or part of it for the original Tiffin Glass Company. They lasted a little over two years. The other company that made the startup at a similar time was the Belgian Glass Works. A little bit of an odd story here. The consul for the country of Belgium to the country of Canada came to Tiffin to build a glass factory to build cathedral glass, stained glass, colored glass to be used in church windows and so forth. He put that factory out on the end of West Adams Street, almost in Hopewell Township, on the Dunn Farm. The purpose was to make flat glass to be used for cathedral windows. Now in those days, you didn't pour glass out on a big slab and make it flat. You blew a huge cylinder, laid it down and split it open and laid it out. They had trouble coming up with the colors, either staining or making the in color. The company lasted a little over two years. Their biggest problem was the fact that the boss that built the factory brought in Belgian glass workers to work alongside American glass workers and paid them more money. So there was labor strife right away at that factory. It closed. Mr. Smith tried to reopen it again for flat glass operation. It was unsuccessful. Now exactly where on West Adams Street that building was located, I do not know. All they described it was on the Dunn Farm. Two factories before A.J. Beatty's sons came to Tiffin. Now included in those eight <coughs> factories that came here in 1888, or were invited in 1888, uh, was the Brewer Pottery Company. A little outfit that made jugs for lemonade and so they progressed a little bit and became American Standard, the largest vitreous china factory in the country was on the street 
right across the street from where A.J. Bakey built. <coughs> Another company that came, Ohio Lantern Works, factory on Hudson Street. Numerous other factories, some of them quite a bit smaller, arrived all at about the same time. But it was all because of natural gas in Northwest Ohio. So what happened then? Here's a book written by Jack Paquette about glass manufacturing in Northwest Ohio. We're talking a 19 county area, basically. 70 glass factories within a 40 year time frame were built in Northwest Ohio. Faustoria, Finley, North Baltimore, Lipsy. A lot of little communities had one and two pot glass operations to make glass. Within 40 years, they were gone. Why? Because they ran out of natural gas. What happened partially was the fact that cities like Finley tapped into the natural gas to build their industry, but they put street lights all the way down through the center of town, fired by natural gas, and burned up 24 hours a day. They depleted the natural gas supply. So the eight factories in Finley all closed within a short period of time for lack of gas pressure. Tippin had a problem also. We'll get into that. A.J. Beatty, Steubenville, Ohio, the largest tableware manufacturer in the country when he was in Steubenville. Several buildings, all of them wood, making glass. The biggest problem the babies had was they were on the Ohio River. They shipped by barge. One to two months a year, that river froze. They would close the factory down because they couldn't produce and ship product. Came to Northwest Ohio at the incentive of the Board of Trade, which, by the way, said, we'll give you $15,000 construction cost for your land. 35000 in cash, and we'll give you five years of free natural gas if you'll move your factory to Tiffin. Sounds like a pretty good deal. A lot of money in 1888. They built the factory. Fourth and Vine was the address. What the city was counting on was that A.J. Beatty and Sons moved 400 employees from Steubenville, Ohio, to Tiffin. They all had to have room and board, they all had to have food, they all had to have clothing. So the city got their money back over a period of time because of the taxation and because of buying and stores and so forth. They even had 30 houses built on 7th, 8th, and 9th Avenue, all brick structures, all identical, to house those employees who moved here from Steubenville. 27 of those buildings are still on the avenues. They've been changed, their porches added, additions put on, siding put on, but they were there for the employees of A.J. Beatty Glass Company when they moved to Tiffin. So A.J. Beatty had this deal going with the city of Tiffin. Great. Beautiful, beautiful display of Beatty Glass here. We have a whole cabinet down at the museum. And by the way, I'm not bringing a lot of things to show you in here, because I'm trying to suck you in to come on down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there on Saturdays from noon to four, and I don't charge a lot. So the babies saw competition rising. In 1891, 16 factories Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, including two in Fostoria and two in Finley, consolidated into the United States Glass Company, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The babies could see competition getting tough. They decided to join that corporation. Now, each of those companies was identified by a letter. Adams Glass in Pittsburgh was Factory A and so forth. Tiffin became Factory R, United States Glass Company, Tiffin, Ohio. Notice I didn't say Tiffin Glass. Factory R 
existed on that spot as part of the United States glass for 71 years, making glass. The factory made glass for 91 years, sold worldwide, at peak production, according to newspaper reports, 900 employees, 100,000 pieces of glass a week, just prior to the Depression. Sold worldwide. We have original catalogs from the corporation talking about sales offices in Caracas, Venezuela, Mexico City, Havana, Cuba even has a sales office. London had a sales office. Brisbane, Australia. New Zealand, it was sold worldwide. So the company had something going for it. But when they became part of the United States Glass Company, they were no longer able to identify their glass as TIF, being made in TIF. Because the company found out quickly that the glass made here in Tiffin was such a better quality than the rest of their factories if they advertised it as being made in Tiffin, they would buy Tiffin glass and forget the other factories. So the glass for 71 years never had a mark on it. No, the only thing they put on it was a little sticker of Tiffin. And folks, you can buy those on the internet yet. You can put on anything you want and it shows up a lot that way. So A.J. Beatty, no longer A.J. Beatty, factory off. 1938, Depression. Things got so bad that they replaced the president of the glass house in glass company in Pittsburgh with a representative, a lawyer, for the franchises of saving industry in the United States. Charles W. Carlson was his name. And Mr. Carlson was a lawyer, but he had an interest in the manufacturing of glass. So we fit beautifully into the profile of making glass. C.W. Carlson gradually, over the years, lost all but two of the original 17 glass factories because of the Depression. 1938, there were only two left. Glassport, Pennsylvania, which was a newly built factory in the 20s, and Tiffin. Why sit in Pittsburgh when Tiffin was the most profitable factory in the country? He moved the entire U.S. glass operation to Tiffin in 1938. Sat in the office out here and began making glass, building the company back up. During the Second World War, when things were tough, he made glass for the Navy Department. Urinals, beakers to measure things with, and so forth. And just as a side note, the purchasing agent for the United States Navy during the Second World War came to Tiffin after the war. Owned a bank in downtown Tiffin. Reported they got off the train and said, I'm going to marry the richest woman in Tiffin. <laughs> Do we know who I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. He came to Tiffin and was hired at the glass factory as the man to control, the comptroller to control the finances of U.S. Glass, Tiffin, Ohio. Pretty soon, he married that richest girl in Tiffin, Ohio. Commercial National Bank evolved. Some other things happened. We did all right with this gentleman, but he's the one that bought from the Navy Department and there are some examples around of some of the products that the Navy bought. I have one at home, and Dave King has one. I think it was engraved by his father on the water. <coughs> one other thing that I forgot to mention here. When all this development in Tiffin was going on, a gentleman from Connecticut looking for a place to build a glass factory <coughs> swung through town. He heard about the deal of the free land and some natural gas and so forth. Couldn't stay. Loved the process and what he could do here, but he loved a woman more than he loved that. So he went to Toledo. Walter Libby established his factory in Toledo then. The woman he loved 
Does the name Ford ring a bell? <laughs> As in Libby Owens Ford? <laughs> That's why he went to Toledo and didn't build a factory here in Tiffany. These are little odds and ends that I come up with looking through something like this, but also with the effort of <coughs> one of our members who is a real newspaper rat sits in the library going through old newspapers, finding articles and so forth. Glass industry in Tiffin, doing pretty well. Into the 30s, the 40s, into the 50s, a re revival of the industry occurring here in Tiffin. Beautiful glass, the Empress Line, and there's other pieces around the room and over in the museum showing you what they made. Other glass companies in Tiffin. Here we go. Find the right notes. Bel Air Lantern and Globe Company. Ever hear of it? We moved into the U.S. glass factory on the corner of 4th and Wall Street. It lasted about four months. Sneath Glass Company lasted two years, making other things, tablewares and so forth. <coughs> Cooperative Glass Company <coughs> made bottles and jars on Union Street, down below the stadium. And I've heard of people saying they found shards of glass down there on a piece of property. That's where they were located. <coughs> and glass decorating companies. Edward Adelsberger had a glass decorating company on the corner of Scott Street and Wentz Street on the southwest corner. This is a neighborhood I grew up in. I never knew anything about it. Unfortunately, Mr. Adelsberger was killed in an auto accident, so his widow took over running the company. His widow ran it for about three years, and eventually it closed. Does the name Martha Forrest ring a bell? <laughs> Martha Forrest's mother ran that glass cutting shop on the corner of Scott and Wentz Street. One of the individuals that worked there was William O. Duke Greiner, a name you should be familiar with because he was one of the master cutters in this country for years and years. Duke came over right after the First World War. He was a soldier in the Kaiser's army. He was a trained glass engraver in Germany. Went to work for Adelsberger Glass, had the opportunity when Adelsberger closed to go to Tiffin Glass and work. Anything around here with Duke Greiner's name on? Not necessarily, but his signature is all over the Eisenhower vase this year. <coughs> that beautiful vase he did in the 1950s with the face of Dwight D. Eisenhower on and the stars around the rim representing Eisenhower and his victory in Europe. Now the side story to that, 1950s, 55 I think, Eisenhower took the tariffs off of imported glass, European and Asian. Duke, being a fine little German individual, said, I ain't giving it to that son of a bitch. <laughs> that desk sat on Martha, or that vase sat on Martha Ziegler's desk at the glass house for years until it came here to the Seneca County Museum. <laughs> William O. Duke Reiner was one of the real classic characters in the glass industry. So Duke was one of them. Mr. King, Clyde King, came to Tiffin in 1955 when Duncan Miller Glass Company, Washington, Pennsylvania, folded. Tiffin, U.S. <coughs> Glass bought them out, bought all rights to make the glass, trademarks, molds, and everything. And there's even a number of employees that moved to Tiffin to continue making that style of glass here. And we were honored to have some of those people there working, Clyde King being one of them. U.S. Glass prospered 
basically until 1963. 1963, financial problems hit. Mr. Carlson went to the banks to see if he could get loans to take over operation of the glass house and continue it. <clears throat> banks were not so willing to at that time. The company went into foreclosure and into receivership. And I was told and saw an article that the company that held that receivership was the organized truck drivers of New Jersey, also called the mob. 1964, four former executives and people involved with the Glass House formed the Tiffin Art Glass Corporation to begin making glass again at the Glass House. Even Governor James A. Rhodes flew into Tiffin for that grand opening ceremony run by William Bill Carlson, the son of Charles W. Carlson. <coughs> the factory did all right for a few years, introduced some new lines of glass, was doing all right. Had an offer, let's sell the glass company. Continental <coughs> Can Corporation was diversifying their product lines to include glass, fine crystal which, by the way, is defined as 20% lead oxide. That's how glass is defined as crystal. So Continental Can purchased the glass house to begin making glass for their product lines for food, for tables. They lasted a little over two years. And by the way, the only time a brochure has been printed about the products from that building that says Tiffin Glass Company was under the leadership of Continental Can a little over two years. So Tiffin Glass as a product name only lasted a little over two years, very late in its lifetime. 1969, Interpace Corporation, a large conglomerate whose main product line was making sewage tiles and large tubes made out of ceramic, bought the glass house. They also had owned a couple other companies on the food service and table side of things, Shenango uh, Pottery, which was tableware, and Franciscan, China, and Lennox Glass. Interpace Corporation ran the factory, producing glass that now is mistakenly called to us all the time by saying, I have some Franciscan glass, can you tell me what it is? Most of the glass that Franciscan produced was old Tiffin lines of glass. And where they are come up the idea of calling all the Franciscan can only be attributed to replacements limited down in North Carolina. So Franciscan glass was made there until 1979. Toll Silversmiths, a Connecticut outfit, saw a need to get into the glass business mostly to harvest the profits. Toll Silversmiths bought the factory in 1979 and turned the furnaces off in 1980. Sold the warehouse for another four years, shut down all the facilities and donated the buildings to the city of Tiffin and walked away. We're not even sure Interpace Corporation ever got paid fully for the buildings they own. Basically, that is the history of Tiffin Glass. Now, if you want to talk specifically about Tiffin Glass itself, as I said, museums open four days a week, mm -hmm. noon to twelve, noon to four o'clock in the <coughs> afternoon. And we'll be glad to have you come down and go through the history of what's there. We have a little over 2,000 pieces on display in the museum itself, and another 12, 1,500 pieces for sale in our shop, which is how we support the operation of the glass, of the glass museum. Any questions? <clears throat> As my wife likes to say, you don't know if I'm going to lie to you or not, but you can always ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my story about Tiffin made glass. It is a wide variety of it, about 92 years of production. But I would be sadly remiss if I didn't talk about crystal traditions. 
Hi, Judy. <laughs> Across the street from Calvert High School on Madison Street, it was opened with a glass blower. I think there may have been two there over the years, two different yeah. ones, so and one. glass engravers. Did a nice job of remanufacturing homemade Tiffin glass. The big <coughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, they never made crystal. Soda lime is what you're allowed, or most people use to make glass nowadays. Now, leaded crystal is something of the past. Tiffin may have been the last major production factory in the country to make leaded crystal. And a word of caution about leaded crystal, if you own some, do not put it in a dishwasher. It will ruin it. And I don't know exactly the chemical composition that causes that problem, but it can get cloudy if you wash it in the dishwasher a few times. I didn't know that. <laughs> it breaks in the dishwasher. You don't put it in there. It breaks when you get me with that big hang on there. <laughs> That's all I got, folks. I appreciate you coming in and listening to my babble for a half an hour. <laughs> Be glad to answer any question that you might have. And uh oh, John well, Huss. When you talked about Adelsberger glass and you said they decorated glass, did yes. they buy glass they from bought other people? They bought glass from other glass manufacturers, yes. And then cut it? Is and that, then okay. cut it or engraved it, as okay. the term is. Okay. I think that's right, isn't it, Dave? It's actually engravers. Or cutters. Or cutters. Or right. cutters. I learned something from these get-togethers also. There's people that probably sit in this room that know as much about some of this stuff as I do. Well, thank you all for allowing me to come and speak with you. Thanks.